They don't call it Antiques Roadshow for nothing. This past summer, the producers brought their equipment, staff, and crew, and appraisers to St. Louis for the first time in 17 years. We're due. It's our turn. totally due. <laughs> all day long, they'll see a steady flow of people estimate the value of all kinds of items, big and small, valuable, and not so much, and tape enough appraisals to fill three episodes. And while those lucky enough to get tickets did do plenty of standing in line, this is really a hectic, non-stop exercise of crowd control that leads to personal one-on-one -on -one interaction. Whether it's a painting or a ceramic bobblehead, a teacup, or of course in St. Louis, baseball memorabilia. While the guests are waiting patiently for their chance to see an appraiser, producers are rushing around making seat-of-the-pants decisions about who and what will make it in front of the cameras. Who's got the most interesting objects? Who's got the most interesting story? Tonight, Living St. Louis takes you behind the scenes at Antiques Roadshow. I'm Jim Kircher in America's Center in downtown St. Louis, and we're here, we're all here, because Antiques Roadshow is here to see thousands of people, to appraise thousands and thousands of items. St. Louis is one of six cities visited this summer for the new season. It's a demanding schedule, it's a big production, but they've been doing it for more than 20 years. And we're about to find out just how they pull it off. They start arriving early in the morning and they will be coming all day long. When Antiques Roadshow started in 1997, it was general admission, first come, first serve. But it got so popular so fast, they now have to hold a lottery in every city because the demand for tickets is far greater than the supply. So as soon as we aired, they fell in love with us. It was in season five, we began ticketing the event because people were like groupies sleeping out overnight to get into the show. What did you bring in today? I brought in this Turkish rug. We brought in um, a folk art carved whale. To keep things moving efficiently, every ticket has an arrival time from morning to late afternoon. In this city here in St. Louis, 16,208 people applied for the 3,000 pairs of tickets that we give out to the public. So what'd you bring? Oh, my mom's pole. And it has, it's very detailed, very ornate. Thank you. Getting into Antiques Roadshow means standing in line. Actually, a series of lines like a theme park. In this first one, you can't even see where they're taping the show. And yet the mood is still pretty good. Got my little robot. Yeah, what, what, what is this? What is this? I got him when I was in about fifth grade. I'm now 61, so he's very old. <laughs> How about you? What do you have today? I have a knife blade Oh. that was made 600 to 800 years ago. You're kidding. What do you What are you guys bringing? I brought a diamond ring that belonged to my great grandmother, and a piece of pottery. It's been in my family for five generations. This is a, an old printer set that has all oh. the pieces. It's moving really quickly, and everyone has really great stuff. So as we go through the line, we're seeing people and seeing what they have and meeting new friends. So it's it's been a good experience. The first line gets you to the table where your items are categorized. Is it a painting, a doll, a gun, a toy, a sports item? Molly Hyland, whose father ran KMOX Radio and whose grandfather was the St. Louis Cardinals team doctor, came with a 1942 World Series ring and some signed photos. The ring that was for the owner of the Cardinals, Sam Braden. We definitely and want to I see what she hears from the appraiser, and we will catch up to her later. Once they see what you've brought, they send you to the next set of lines. You're put in the one that will get you to the right appraiser's table inside that familiar looking set. These were mass produced, but we can narrow, narrow it down to Germany or Japan. You might wait a couple of hours for a couple of minutes with an expert who will estimate the value of your object. And at auction, the pair of them are going to be worth somewhere in the 100 to 150 dollars.
Out of the thousands of people, about 150 will be chosen to have their appraisals taped in front of the TV cameras. But only some of those will actually make it into the final program, which has become public television's highest rated series. I think the appeal of the show is that it is, there are no actors on our show. It's appraisers who, when they're not working as in their field of expertise, they're working. They don't do television. It's guests who come and their one time on television is, is here. Or on the uh, professional tennis circuit. Or... We're going to learn something when we hear them learn about their objects. You cannot watch a season of Roadshow and not, and not learn when the Civil War happened. You can't. You're going to learn. And I think people hunger for pure information. Got a dueling gun. Uh huh. And then I have a bronze sculpture. Oh, nice, nice. There are so many objects, so many people, so many stories, so many choices that have to be made by the producers in so little time. And there is a lot of discussion and debate going on backstage about who gets in front of the cameras. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. To really appreciate this road show, it's best to arrive the day before. Wherever the road show goes, they start with a large, empty convention hall. And some cities don't have a space large enough to handle it all. But St. Louis does. And when the crew moves in, you better step aside. After all these years and all those cities, they've gotten pretty good at this. Setting up on Friday, taping on Saturday, and by Sunday, Everything's gone. We tracked down somebody who could help us make sense of all this. I'm Jill Giles, and I'm a line producer with Andy Stroud. What does line producer mean? I guess it means different things in different places, but line producer for Andy Stroud Show, um, what I do is, before we go out, I do the site visits and help select the cities that we're going to be going to, and then I'll work to hire the local crews that will help us out. What made St. Louis some place you could come? Well, we're, we, Antique Sorcho takes up a pretty big footprint, so first of all, we have to have a, a venue that can accommodate us size-wise, so um, America Center is perfect for us to hold our event in. Um, so once we can accommodate the crowds that are going to come mm -hmm. and uh, also the television set that we're going to put up, um, that would be the first thing. And then it's like, have we been there? We want to cover the country. We want to go somewhere in the Midwest, Northeast, Northwest, Southwest. So it's kind of spreading it out and seeing where we were the year before. And, and it's been 17 years since you've been to the region. It's been 17 years since we've been to St. Louis. So we're really excited. To be back so we're due. Area. It's our we're turn. We're totally due. <laughs> <laughs> what is this looks like? It's going to be some sort of transformer thing. So tell me about what the <laughs> set looks like. So the set here at the America Center um, will be uh, we, we bring our own lighting truss that gets supported from the ground and it kind of makes it like a circus tent atmosphere where around the perimeter all the appraising is happening of all the items that people bring in and then right in the center of that set we're actually filming selected appraisals so you'll be able to see what's going on in the background, people are getting their appraisals and then whatever items we've chosen to highlight in the foreground. So that's kind of the imprint of the set. All the roadshow equipment travels from city to city in semis the producers out of Boston bring 55 regular roadshow staff and crew members to each location and hire on another 15 people locally to make all this happen. And to help manage the people and move the lines on taping day, local stations like the Nine Network organize an army of more than a hundred volunteers. And that really help us move the event. So when you see People tomorrow, the most of the crowd and the guests that are arriving will be interacting with volunteers because they're really the, the face of Roadshow on Saturdays. By Saturday morning, it's all ready to go. The ticket holders are in line with their stuff, the appraisers are appraising, the crew is running cameras. And now, Jill Giles has a very different job. I am one of the producers that picks the items that go on television. But we can't talk about that without talking first about the appraisers, because they're the ones who see the stuff, meet the people, and pitch the stories. Our experts deserve so much credit. We work with a group of about 150. We assign about 70 to every city. 
and they are in love with what they do. They are jazzed by the material. So a $10 spoon could come in with an amazing story that will really excite these guys. What you got here is a monk hiding a liquor flask, you know? Which maybe they do. I don't know. <laughs> they might have one. But this one's doing it. And uh, it was I do it because, first of all, it's the greatest fun in the world. And we are volunteering our time, and I can think of no better way to volunteer than to share some knowledge that you have with the American public. Uh, it was not uncommon in, certainly in prohibition times, to have sort of hidden liquor flasks and to have flasks that were whimsical in that. More and more people want to know all the other things about it before the value. They want to know what it is, they want to know where it came from. But if you put it in an antique shop, it would likely be a hundred dollars, maybe seventy-five to hundred. And I will say, certainly with the things I look at, most things have very little monetary value. So um, we're quite good about explaining that. But, but it's, it's very common that people are less concerned about the monetary value than they are about if you like the, the family. Well, it's my grandmother's. Yeah. Okay. Well, my mom said it was her mom. Yeah. People will often bring us something that's been in the family for a very long time. And uh, one of the things I like to tell them is that I'll remind them that it's the oldest member of their family. And in some respects, they can, they can treat it that way. You know, they can respect it, they can admire it, they can bring it out and use it occasionally on family occasions. And, and people are often very happy to think of things that way. It was probably more than what I thought it would have been. Oh, really? Yeah. And it was 75 to $100 for the items, and I just wouldn't have thought they were even that much, yeah. worth that much. So that was just kind of nice. But you're probably so not going to go out and try to sell it, though, right? No, no. Yeah. They were my mom's <laughs> items, so it was just nice getting them from her. They weren't sure if... They volunteer their time. They do not, we do not pay their travel expenses here. We do not pay their hotel nights here. So it costs them money to be here at Roadshow. We definitely give them breakfast and lunch tomorrow. <laughs> we feed them. But we've also changed their lives. And, and we have about eight and a half million viewers a week. And, and that is a lot of people to get to know you. How did you get this? But we've changed their lives in other ways. And they could tell you about the, the collegiality that they have between each other that they didn't have as competitors before working on a, the set of Roadshow together. One of the appraisers who didn't have to travel very far was St. Louis and Susan Kime. We found her at the paintings and prints table, and we had a lot of things we wanted to ask, but this clearly is not the time or place for a leisurely conversation. So after all this was over, we stopped into her place of business, the Link Auction Galleries, in the old Methodist church that's part of the Holy Corners Historic District. She showed us around and told us the Antiques Roadshow opportunity just sort of fell in her lap. Another art appraiser couldn't make a taping and gave her name to a producer. So I just got a cold call uh, asking if I wanted to go to El Paso and participate in Antiques Roadshow and it was great. It was so much fun and very intimidating. I didn't know anyone and I went by myself, but it was a lot of fun. But it has to be also mentally exhausting to do what you do that long, person after person after person. It is, you know, you're, you feel like you've got this frozen smile by the end of the day because you've had to be nice to so many people for about a 13 hour stretch. Um, and not just be nice, but just be, um, as informative as you possibly can. Uh, and it is, it's exhausting. You meet so many people in a condensed period of time and you hear about these prized possessions that they have and, um, and that's what's um, really eye-opening and, and educational for, for us as appraisers. Yeah, but it's fast. It's almost like speed dating, isn't it? You it have is. To, you have to come up with something pretty quickly and try to be as accurate and honest as you can in a short period of time. And to be honest, there are things that, um, that come to us and there's not a whole lot you can really say about those things. 
But when there is something to say that sets an object apart from the others, the appraiser gets word to Jill Giles, we may have something for the camera. We are following. The guest and their object are pulled aside, given a seat, and Jill and an appraiser or two start assessing just what they have. The object, value, but especially the story. My uh, sister was a nun in Mother Teresa's Arden, Giles. And these are little cards that Mother Teresa wrote to my sister. She went from the Mother Teresa collection to examine a Japanese architecture book. This man brought a model of a train car. This one, a collection of Civil War photographs. And then it's decision time. After consideration and debate, and perhaps additional research, they will make the final cut. In one case, the guest just knew too much about his object and its value, so that on camera, there could be no big reveal. None of the surprise or disappointment that would make good TV. There's well, nothing I, we're going to be able to tell him. Yeah. So um, we'll pass on this. Right, I'm going to go talk to Bert, and I will be right back. To Thank you so much. Where do we go? Yeah, in the middle? Yeah, we pulled it to the middle. Oh, Lord, I've yeah. got to go put back yep. in. Exactly. Right in and out real quick. Thank you. So um, it's just going to be you and one camera. Some appraisals will be taped with one camera as shorter or snapshot segments. Others will take center stage. That's where the man with the train car ended up. But no spoilers, not from us. The decision about what would actually make it into one of the three St. Louis episodes, that would be made much later. I very carefully lay out the shows so that in fact, most of the time the big payoff is at the the last appraisal, the last multi-cam big appraisal at the end. But I'm also pacing it out. I know where we're going to put the snapshot sequences. So I have, like, there's an energy to it, certain appraisals. As you all know, some are quieter than others. And so I strategically put them in to sort of push you next. Or if we learn some odd thing, let's say we happens tomorrow, we learn some odd thing that most people don't know about the city, and it connects to something else about St. Louis. I might put them back to back. So yes, I'll do little things like that to make, to make it a more watchable show and to make sure that nobody leaves Roadshow after they stop watching. Right. I have never been there. Never Raphael Elledge, uh, who does military rifles and what have you, uh, he gave me the best advice. He said, um, just pitch the story. Don't pitch the object. Uh -huh. When you go to the producer, if someone ha if, if the guest is great, they've got a wonderful personality, you know, pitch that. That's right. what makes good TV. All right, have a great time. Right, Enjoy it. This is an antique globe. My grandmother and grandfather were in the circus turn of the century, and this was her act. She walked on this globe with fantail pigeons on her arms, and she'd go up and down teeter totters. And she worked in the big shows. Have you had this um, uh, appraised yet? Oh, no. no. What are you hoping they tell you? You know, I have no idea what the value is with it. We have a lot of pictures in the suitcase. She was also a photographer in the circuses. Her circus name was Kitty Kelly. Oh, well, my dad was in World War One, and I brought this shell of a cannon, I guess. Things engraved on it. Well, they said it was French art, but they said they had an awful lot of it. But anyways, this is very special. Yeah. And so my kids love it, and I'm sure the grandkids do too. Uh, what did you bring today? I brought a Russian cigarette case from, it's pre-revolutionary. Um, did you know this before you got here? No, okay. I didn't. I didn't. It was a gift from a friend in New York. It's lovely. And it would have had like a ribbon or a silk Fred, and it was worth a thousand to two thousand dollars. They said when you came, you just thought eh, it might be worth something. Uh, I don't know what it is. I tried looking it up, and I'd seen one on Sotheby's website that was like twenty-five hundred pounds. So I thought it might be worth something. So I wanted to bring it and see. So I wonder, this? with the internet, um, how much more knowledgeable are people now about the objects they bring in? It's a really great question. With the internet, people come in sometimes with pages and pages of printed information about their object. Um, 
and they could often be right. We don't have much to teach them at that point. Um, I think a lot of what we do get here are people who have looked on the internet at a painting, paintings maybe, if it's paintings, um, with the same name as their artist that signed their painting. But did that guy really paint it? Is that authentically his? Is that his signature? Is it right? Is the materials right? And people need help for that. The internet is no substitute for touching things and having the experience our experts have. Mary Strauss of Fox Theater fame brought in her painting of St. Fabiola that might or might not be the lost original, painted by Jean-Jacques Henner in 1885 and missing for more than a hundred years. The problem with this painting is that it's one of the most copied paintings of all time. In fact, a Belgian artist has exhibited more than 300 St. Fabiola portraits that he's collected over the years. And I think it's maybe the missing painting. So you want to find out? Yep, I do want to find out. She got to the paintings and prints table and St. Fabiola did attract some attention. The appraisers gave it much more than a cursory glance. But is this the lost original? Maybe, maybe not. And I think that you really need to go to the source, and that, that would be the source. Yeah. It, would be, it would be lovely if it turned out to be the, one the, the one. the one. The yeah. one. Okay, I will go to the museum. It's, it's, it's nice the verdict one. is I have to contact his museum in Paris to find out if it's a real Henner or not. Yeah. So it might be. It might be. But they I can't might. give you a definitive no, answer. No, I can't give they can't give me a definitive answer. Yeah, right. okay. So here I go again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The producers don't I don't think they just want big ticket items. Right. They want interesting things. Uh, that you can tell stories about, and those aren't always going to be the $200,000 painting. So, you know, it might be a reproduction uh, that was done in the 70s, and we have to talk about that. Um, but, but there's also really hidden gems that, that come in that um, really make up for that. And the, the knockoffs and fakes are always interesting, but they have to be really disappointing. They're disappointing to the owners. Most are good sports but they were some of the best lessons we can teach you are in what those fakes teach us. We don't want you to be a victim of that. If you buy a reproduction, we want it's an eyes wide open purchase. There was never really any doubt that Molly Highland had brought the real thing, the Cardinals owner's 1942 World Series ring and a photograph signed by Dizzy and Paul Dean. And when she got to the table, Appraiser Leela Dunbar's eyes just lit up. They don't have this. This is spectacular. To have the red of the cardinals on there is fantastic. They're normally basic gold. Uh, so to see that, I have to tell you, it's one of the best rings I've seen, and the condition is fantastic. Now, these World Series rings, depending on who they're awarded to, can sell anywhere from $5,000 to $50,000. I would say, given who this was given to, my opinion would be that this would probably, at auction, would be somewhere around ten dollars to $15,000, maybe more, and I would insure it for at least $30,000 because of the provenance and coming down to the family. I mean, this is really spectacular ring. This photo, you know, Dizzy and Paul, you rarely see anything signed by both of them, particularly in a large format like this. I'm not, I don't know if another one existed, and I'll tell you again, the color is so vivid here in the red. Wow. Uh, ain't my day. <laughs> it's as good as it gets for St. Louis. It really does. For whatever reason or combination of reasons, she wasn't chosen for a taping. But like most of the people here, that's not really why she came. Well, I was impressed. I was impressed that she was impressed. It was really, it was a really good experience. I was really excited to see that they were um, valuable, but I don't think I'll ever sell them, but uh, it, it was neat to see. So them. many times people find out what the value is and say, but of course I'm not going to sell it. It's true. I, some years ago when I was just a naive deer in headlights, I wanted to make a series about what people do with their objects after a road show because they must sell it, right? It's worth half a million dollars. Sure, they're going to get rich of and course. retire, right? It wasn't my grandmother's painting, and they don't sell it. And so there weren't enough stories to tell to make a series. And we could not make, we can't make that show. People leave here, they may go and show their object because they realize the 
homeowners won't take care of it anymore, they need a rider. Often it's objects that have been inherited. There's always a cost to sell. Even if you do it online somewhere, there's always a cost to sell. So the day you sell it, you can't afford to buy it back if you could find it again. And it belonged to your great, 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 great grandmother. You really want it? Sell it? And the answer for most people is no. Antiques Roadshow started out as a BBC program, which is still on the air. The American version is as popular as ever. Success, of course, has brought imitations and knockoffs. But those other programs tend to feed on personality and personality conflict. And a payoff, that's a payoff. Antiques Roadshow, though, has stuck to one unbreakable rule. There's no other show in this genre. And since we came, we were the first, now there's probably over 20, um, that is, does no buying and selling. We're it. And we will not buy and sell because it's unethical to appraise and then make an offer to buy something. No offers, no buying, no selling. The payoff is still the story. William McKinley walking the Look at this. <laughs> it's everyday people coming in with what is in their house. And lo and behold, it's interesting.